Thank you, PG. Big thanks to, to PG and Cameron and everybody else who uh, put this on and to the audience for being here today. Um, Austin Davis, nice to meet you. I'm going to let everybody do quick introductions down the line. You can see the names on the board here, but let's start at the end with uh, Sarah. We just did a, a nice panel on decentralization next door, so do a quick introduction of yourself and then we'll run down the line. Hi, I'm Sarah Mansky. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Global Studies here at UCSB. I study public policy and ethics and global technology. I look at blockchains in the cooperative movement, both here in the United States and Europe, and how people are using blockchain technology to further the development of the solidarity economy in the commons. Hi, my name is Dr. Lena Martin. I'm the founder and director of Blockchain at Pepperdine, started earlier this year. It's a center for curriculum as well as certificates and um, conferences such as these, and uh, co-laboratories for research and development with partnering industry um, and, and companies. And I will be teaching the first blockchain course for Pepperdine in the spring in applications and analytics. And I also um, own a company where we work on blockchain consulting. And hello, my name is Naja Roberts. I'm the Chief Visionary Officer for Crypto Blockchain Club. We are one of the first, not only, but one of the first uh, cryptocurrency exchanges over the counter in Los Angeles. And we have a host of educational classes meetups, everything it pertains to cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. Awesome. My name is Aaron Casillas. I'm a managing member of Outside Box Capital. It's a proprietary trading firm um, and we focus uh, doing consulting work uh, mainly in Latin America. That's exciting. Definitely a, a, a good uh, sector to kind of bring on board, right? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on throughout the world and uh, especially with this technology, a lot of it's happening outside of the United States, which is, you know, kind of interesting. Yeah, a lot of the really, you know, needful applications for it are, are outside of the U.S., right? I mean, why do you think Libra was targeting third world countries, you know, for their system, right? They're, the unbanked, the underserved, uh, the, a lot of the systems are more fragile than, than ours is here. Not that ours is perfect in any way. Of course, we need it too, but other places maybe need it more because they're literally collapsing in real time. So, um, so that's interesting, but that leads us to the topic of the panel, which is community and mass adoption. So the, the people up here are perfectly uh, positioned to uh, talk about community and bring people on board, such as academia, industry, Latin America, you know, plug doing uh, educational workshops, and Sarah here, at, uh, in, as well as academia, UCSB, um, and Pepperdine. It's awesome, I support those guys over there. I love what you're doing, excited to see it coming together and then actually teaching a program coming up, that's, that's amazing. Um, so, speaking of community mass adoption, you know, communication is a big part of community, getting the word out, right? Spreading, spreading the word, making people understand what the technology is about so they're not afraid of it, um, maybe uh, getting rid of some of the stigma. So, what are, what are some of the challenges that, um, in no particular order, or speak up whenever you want, uh, that you've seen some hurdles in the industry that, that, uh, that we face towards adoption? Well, because blockchain challenges legacy corporations and nation states, one of the first things I've encountered when I tell people about my research is that, uh, oh, Bitcoin is for criminals, right? And it, it, that is not a coincidence that the mainstream media has kind of pushed this idea that this technology is not for you, right? And so that's one hurdle we have to overcome, that um, it's beyond Bitcoin, it's about beyond the bro culture tech geeks, you know. It is for everybody if they embrace it. It's interesting because the journey most people go on, and of course I read this, this is not mine, but it usually starts with disdain, right? Anybody who starts learning about it, oh, how is that possible? How can, you know, crypto, for example, money, digital assets, how can it be not backed by something? This is crazy. And then it goes into skepticism, and then they start learning a little more, and there's more information in the news. And then it goes into curiosity. Oh, okay, what if? What does this look like? And then there's this moment called Chris 
crystallization. This is what we know as falling down the rabbit hole, right? And all of a sudden your mind is blown and you think, wow, is this really possible? How can this you know, technology bring more effectiveness and, and um, accountability? And, and then it goes into acceptance stage, right? So communicating is so important at that stage because Honestly, when you start to see it and what the possibilities are, you can't unsee it. And that's when you really start to be able to take action based on it. And communication is such an important part of communicating um, this vision to impact others and to enable others to act as well. That's right. Knowledge is power. And so the challenges that I see uh, moving forward in the community is Almost nine out of ten people have never even heard of Bitcoin. Insane. Insane. Not only have they never heard of it, once you begin to explain it, it is like, what is the need? Like, there's no money issue. There's no financial corruption. They're they're it's living on the street. Anything, right? <laughs> yeah, it's it's just it's just a, a there are an array of challenges, and so I will kind of share what we've done to kind of. Uh, get over that hump, but it's just really getting people. I think once people understand how money works, because we've never been taught how money works. When we learn how money works, then we understand why there's a need for a, a change or a, an alternative, not necessarily a change, but an alternative. And so those are the challenges that we face in dealing with people on a daily basis is helping them just understand the regular dollar, dime, quarter, nickel, penny, most people yeah. probably still think the U.S. dollar is backed by gold. Oh, they it's do. Totally they do. They and, do. And they probably also don't know that this is something um, my friend Wiz wrote an article about Bitcoin about a year ago, I think. So I just read it recently because I discovered it online. I was like, oh, I know Wiz. So anyways, he talks about security, privacy, and freedom being like a, the fundamental backbones of why Bitcoin is awesome, right? And it starts off talking about how in 1933, the government reclaimed all the gold coins that were out there basically by force. If you didn't want to hand them over, like, no, you need a trackable certificate now. Like, you can't just have gold that you're trading. We need to be put, serialize everything. We need to know who has what. So, um, that's a problem, right? Yeah, I just heard recently it stopped being backed in 1972, I think, so. Yeah, it was a problem even before that happened. And then, yeah, so anyways, I want to I wanna let uh, uh, Aaron here have a word and then we can keep going on. Thank you. Uh, so a couple of things. One is a lot of the perspective of the development that goes on in the blockchain space is really targeted towards the developed world. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an example of the work I do uh, in Latin America, particularly Venezuela and Argentina, uh, the, the issues that you're, you're talking about, and remember the, uh, the, the focus of this is mass adoption. So the masses are using third, three generations old Android phones. And that's the, the means of, of accessing this blockchain technology. So if you're not if you're not building applications that uh, work on you know an old Android fifty dollar phone, it's they're, they're just there's, they literally cannot interact with that uh, that technology. In, in those areas or in all areas, you're saying average people are using older phones. I, I don't know. I couldn't speak to the to the rest of the world, but those two countries, okay. uh, it, it's just a, it's an access issue. And right. so if you're not developing for that you have no chance of, of reaching these people. So that's the, the, the challenging part. The, the good part about it is that we're talking about the uh, kind of getting people on board to, with uh, you know, the, the currency backed by gold. That's, again, uh, a, a, a um, developed world um, narrative because you don't have to sell people in, our, in Venezuela uh, about the need for a decentralized uh, currency. You just tell them that this is a currency that your government cannot mess with. And they're like, okay, where do I sign? Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> and, and then the other, the other argument that comes up is, well, it's so volatile. If you look at charts of volatility uh, with, with the, these particular currencies, uh, it, it is volatile in, in the sense that it goes up. Hyperinflation. It, well, their their currencies, but the value of like bitcoins, Ethereum, cryptocurrencies, uh, it, it is volatile, but it's volatile on the way up. On average, it's, it looks like this. It, exactly. Right. You go up to the beginning, to the end. Yeah. And that's so, even uh, considering you know the you know our bear market. Right. Yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting to see that 
cryptocurrencies, especially Bitcoin and Ethereum, things that have been around a little bit longer, they get used on a daily basis, are becoming more stable over time. So not only are they going up, uh, they're becoming more stable, which means you can use them for more applications, right? Um, so yeah, it's definitely interesting. Uh, yeah, but uh, going back to the gold thing, I think it's interesting. Part of that communication is, okay, so what, what backs blockchain technology and Bitcoin specifically? It's math, right? Um, and what governs the entire universe? Math. <laughs> like that, that's a good solid argument, right? The, the laws of thermodynamics pretty much control the entire universe. Like you can't fight that. Like that's one thing that I think they should teach. My background is engineering. They teach that in engineering and some other disciplines, but they don't teach it in economics. And I think they should. I think that should be. And we were talking about Jeremy Rifkin um, last night. He, he hammers that in all the time about, you know, resources need to be considered, and that's why we are where we are now. And efficiency of any nation state is what 20 percent maxed out so everything needs to change and it needs to change now so it's exciting that it is how do we get the word out um so what are speaking of that what are some good success stories that you've seen either in latin america or locally or in academia that uh, are, are good at doing that well i guess i can start um, i hate to say that we're gimmicky but because of the communities that we deal with and by the way you don't have to be in a third world country to have the conditions that are in some of our neighborhoods in America. Mississippi, they have those phones. Alabama, they have those phones. Most of the South suffers from the, the third, fourth party uh, generation Android phones. So we have those problems that exist. But specifically for us, what we found brings attention is we do like a Bitcoin pizza day. So we introduced the first transaction of Bitcoin but we not only gave them a pizza from Papa John's and had pa Papa John's partner with us, we gave out $5 worth of Bitcoin. Now, some may argue that it cost us more to send that five bucks in Bitcoin and it took forever. But the point was we, we always have to do something to attract people to what it is we're doing to kind of even explain just the basics and let them look at that five bucks and see what it does. And, that's what we're doing to just try to get over the hurdle of what it looks like inner city. Now I have a couple of different clients. My clients go from inner city neighborhood, which I'm calling Silicon Hoods. We're building like Silicon, Silicon Hoods. Silicon Hoods. Um, and so, um, and then I have clients that have been in cryptocurrency since the beginning, miners. They came to me to mine. I didn't listen, I wish I had. But, um, so we're just doing different things for different demographic of people that we know will attract them. And so that's how we're having to look at it. So our avatar is so different in every community, in every different way, and we're having to compartmentalize the message that goes out. And it's really, it's really scary how far back uh, a lot of our communities are right here in the U.S. Right. Yeah, and you, I've seen one thing that you're doing as well that I really love is that you're teaching kids how to code, right? Yes. At, at an early age, which gets them excited about things like this because the fundamental basis of all of this is, is code, and if they know how to write a couple lines of it even, that's very powerful compared yes. to yeah, like what that might expand to in their understanding of the world that they're growing up in, which will be almost completely controlled by code <laughs> compared to what it is now. Absolutely. Well, obviously for blockchain at Pepperdine, the focus being on education as well as creating awareness and engagement opportunities. So what's so important about that is building this um, group, coalition, whatever you call it, just like we're doing here today. We're educating, we're teaching, and we're learning from each other, and that's how we're communicating out, right? Again, trying to get people to that point of blowing their minds and realizing what this actually means for individual people out there in the world, where we can actually own our own data, where we can actually have freedom, the economic playing field, leveling that out, right? So it's creating opportunities for people, but getting to them, right? Getting to the masses and teaching that is so important. Um, I study the, like a global social movement trying to use technology to move beyond capitalism and they're developing blockchains and post-blockchain technology to do things that have strategically been something that activists need, like being able to avoid state repression. Like you see in Hong Kong right now how uh, the activists there are having to use technologies to be able to avoid the state from 
monitoring where they're going to hold their next demo. Um, and so one of the applications that I'm most excited by is Holochain, where they are building applications to be able to distribute the internet outside of our traditional um, ways that it's served to us. And so I think the more that the communities that are actually impacted by um, disaster capitalism partner up with developers and coders and um, angel investors, honestly, the more we'll start to see applications that actually have a, a real use in people's lives. Um, and I don't know if anybody else has anything. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting to talk about Holochain, because I remember before they launched, I had a bunch of conversations with Nicholas Perrin and some of the team, so it's exciting you follow them. I'm a big fan as well, and um, yeah, I think they're, they're doing great things for the industry. Um, go ahead. Um, so it's, it's exciting, because there's a lot of uh, opportunity here, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the notion of mass adoption, because we're dealing with humans at this point, uh, that's the mass in, in adoption, the masses, the massive. Right. Uh, we know how to deal with people. We, we, this is not, uh, that part is not new. People are, are actually pretty predictable. And uh, in terms of getting people to, to use this, uh, it's, it's, it's relatively simple in that you kind of need to meet them where they're at. What are their needs? Like, going into communities and not being the expert. Mm -hmm. Sure, I know a little bit about blockchain, but if I, there's no surer way for me to fail in the notion of mass adoption than me going into community and saying, look, this is how you do it, this is what it can be used for. It's much, much better to see what is your need, like what, what, what's going on in, in your community, and uh, let's see if there's a good fit. Um, the, the success story kind of uh, dealing with that was, um, um, in Venezuela, I think I put this in the email, that uh, this was kind of harnessing what at that time was pretty unique in uh, using a DAO, community-funded uh, DAOs, and this is kind of in the, in the Dash model. Um, at what, you know, now, kind of, there are a lot of people doing it, but at that point, it was, it was relatively new. And so we were able to, uh, to harness the proposal system to uh, create a proposal in Venezuela, and starting with the, with the, the premise, again, what, what do you need? And what I saw was there's some tremendously talented people in these regions, really, really, I mean, engineers, attorneys, doctors, uh, teachers, and, and they're just sitting idly by because they are living in, a, in what's uh, you know, a non-functioning state in terms of uh, Venezuela. Uh, and so you have this tremendous human capital that is just waiting to be to be uh, to be utilized so it, it really started uh, from knowing a guy that was a chef and this is one of these one of these professions that uh, you know you we don't it's, you don't equate it with blockchain but uh, he there's no so what are the problems uh, there's no food when there is food there's no money when there is money the exchange rate changes from not only day to day but from morning to afternoon. So these are all problems that had a solution. And uh, so we kind of built from that, and this is really how it started. I said, well, here's this, this, this DAO that's offering money, basically value, and how do we get it into the, the, the people's hands that really need it, and this fellow needs it. So I uh, wrote a proposal uh, to, to fund this fellow to, to, to feed people. And which is a huge deal in Venezuela. Uh, it, it, certainly now, but even a couple of years ago, 2017. And it just grew from there because then all of these other needs kind of exposed themselves. Well, if you've got these, these uh, barbecues, if you're gonna feed, be feeding people and for free, it's a huge, huge deal. How do we market this in, in terms of public relations? Let's get on radio stations, let's get on TV stations, let's partner with the Red Cross uh, to, to really make this legitimate because we're not experts in, in food distribution. Uh, the chef is, is not necessarily, he's a really good uh, cook. Anyway, I'm kind of babbling on, but uh, it, it, it turned out to be a really huge project. We, we fed like 3,000 people. We had an education component similar to this where we would uh, rent the, uh, you know, the really nicest, largest hotels and we would teach about blockchain. And uh, where, where it was uh, kind of a challenge in that money is very difficult to come by there, if you've got funds coming from a DAO where it's kind of more plentiful, 
uh, you're able to access a lot, it's a leverage, a lot of leverage, so we're able to, to, to do these things. And uh, it, it, I was very proud of it, and uh, so that kind of one success story. That's I great, yeah, that. that's a great success story. Thanks, that's like, yeah, I, I, wanna, I wanna read some more into that, because I wasn't aware of that before. So, I mean, I saw your email, but thanks for sharing. Great story. Um, any other success stories we wanna share before jumping into another topic? All right, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it going here, and I, I don't know how much more time we have, but uh, so I think one of the things that I've been um, interested in over the past uh, couple of years is uh, gaming, because I think it is a good gateway as well. I think a lot of young people are playing games, and digital assets are heavily used inside of games, so I think you've seen a lot of the NFTs and things like that have been emerging, especially over this year, um, more applications, you know, more standards, like the 1155, ERC 1155 was just um, accepted as a standard, I think, over the summer, so recently. Um, and it's exciting because I think if people don't need to fully understand it, but if they're using it inside of games and there's millions of game users, you know, um, if not over a billion globally, right? Uh, so I think, you know, esports is a really big proponent moving forward of, of this industry. Um, in an indirect way, somewhat, right? Like, just because it's, it's a more secure way to transfer these in-game assets from one another and potentially sell them, right? Um, my wife, actually, when she, before she moved uh, back here from Mexico, she, uh, she was born in Texas, moved to Mexico, grew up there, moved back, but she sold her World of Warcraft character to someone online before she moved back here, right? And it was through PayPal. So what happened when she came here, she had this money and then they reversed the transaction so she no longer had the money. So, you know, using the blockchain to secure your digital assets and transfer them in a game, I think it's very useful in a simple way. Also, so you can, provenance, so you can prove that it is what it says it is, right? Because some of those things are very valuable, so you don't want to be overpaying for a magic cloak that is not a magic cloak, if you will. Any, any thoughts on esports and gaming? Gaming certainly is the future of learning, so they say, right? It's one of the, the fastest and uh, most easily digestible ways, I think, of learning, obviously. Um, unfortunately, uh, this also makes me think of regulation then, because of what's going on. I think there was a speaker, right, on the travel rule that's coming up and whether NFTs are being going to be part of that as well. So it, it's kind of changing sort of the, the landscape, but when we go back to the idea of mass adoption, regulation is a key part of that, mm -hmm. institutionalizing approaches of, of, of that nature. It's actually um, making those institutionalized approaches as like the last step of Cotter, which is just change management 101, right? So, so it's an important step. However, in an industry such as blockchain, which is so new right now, we're still new, even though we're probably all think that we've been in it for a long time. It's it's still new to the masses. So what does that look like, right? So with regulation, it's going to take those companies, those people that have a lot of courage and character and are willing to stand up and, and make some dense uh, set of precedents, basically, in the industry. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with things like gaming and how regulation will play a role in mass adoption. Yeah, and it's, it's nothing new. I mean, games have been using virtual currency since before Bitcoin existed, right? You know, um, so it's it's interesting to see that it's just one step in the evolution, right, in the digital asset uh, in games. Yep. Go ahead. I have a big smile on my face because, believe it or not, the children that we teach in crypto kids camp get cryptocurrency and blockchain technology way before the adults. Of course. <laughs> and <laughs> it's absolutely awesome. So part of our going beast mode on breaks is online gaming and the kids like get it and they are like this is it like i want to mine i want to you know and so it's incredible what we can do if we impact change in our children so as they grow again the technology grows with them and by the time they're adults we'll be speaking a lot less about mass adoption of those little insignificant not backed by anything except this video game it's 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 gonna it's gonna people really need to pay attention absolutely that that group is going to get and mass adoption is going to hit it especially when, when your kids racking up all these coins in the game and all yes. of a sudden they're buying stuff with yes. wait a minute what, you're shopping yes. online with game coins yes. Yeah. yeah it's awesome i think uh, austin that's a you actually put, gave a very good example of meeting people where they are 
um, a lot of the, the millennial generation and younger, that's what they're into. They're into gaming, uh, and uh, so the you know the, a lot of tokenization and, and like these things. I didn't know on the previous panel that uh, Korea was such a, a big innovator in that space. But you're right. Uh, this is a really good example, and like we're not just saying of meeting people where they are. If if we really want mass adoption, this is how to do it. I mean, it's not going to be uh, a lot of the. Uh, the really hardcore cool tech, which is so cool for all of us that are in it, right. but when you're talking about the mass again of people, it, you know, it's kind of really what can you do for me? And yeah. gaming is really talking talking to these folks. Right, and like, you think one of the things that made the internet blow up was websites. Everyone wanted to put a forward-facing thing to the world of what they're, they're all about, right? This is what we do, we sell flowers, okay? Now all of a sudden, instead of selling flowers in one neighborhood, you're selling it in all neighborhoods, you know, or you're helping people sell them in all neighborhoods. Now you're a middleman instead of a shop owner. So it's definitely, um, I think it's a step in that direction as well. So it's exciting times for sure. I think we might be out of time. So thanks so much, PG, and thanks everybody here for uh, showing up. A round of applause to yourselves and to the panelists. And uh, yeah, exciting times. Thanks for being here.